Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Patrons Autumn Quarter Regional Transportation Seminar. Today is our great, great honor having Professor Han Aldrich from New York University joining us to talk about a very important topic, which is to offer a safe, safer urban transportation system in the area of connected and autonomous vehicles and big data. These, these key terms are all show up in the topic. I was going to um, say that you took it. Professor Alfie joined the Civil and Urban Engineering at New York uh, University Penden School of Engineering and the Center for Urban Science and Progress as a tenured full professor uh, in 2013. Uh, he's currently the director of the C2 Smart Center, which is a tier one university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. The UW is a part of that center as well. Um, prior to joining the New York University, uh, uh, Professor Osby was a tenured full professor at uh, Rutgers University's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, professor Osby has more than 30 years of expertise in transportation and traffic engineering. His research interests in transportation cover a wide range of topics including the development of simulation models of large networks with connected and auto autonomous vehicles, advanced technology and sensing applications for intelligent transportation systems, modeling and evaluation of traffic incidents, and emergency management systems, etc. So let's welcome Professor Osby to give us the seminar. Thank you, Yuhan, uh, for the kind introduction. And it's my great honor to be here. I'm doing a lot of hard time to Jeff. He's entertaining me today uh, all over the place. And I hope you enjoy my talk. I know the attention span is 10 minutes, and then you go to your phones. So maybe I can get some of your attention uh, before, before I do that. Um, so this is actually a long presentation. So I might jump over some slides to give you an idea. And the presentation, I'll leave it with um, Jeff and Minhai. I think we share it with you. Uh, for the details. I want to give you a feeling of uh, what we do, and um, as you know, my mentioned, I am interested in many topics, and when you're my age, you have this uh, kind of a, the passport and the permission to do whatever you want. So um, so uh, with that, um, let me just give you a brief uh, overview of my presentation. When I read the um, abstract, I felt I promised too much, but then I, let me say, I said, let me just touch everything I said, and then uh, based on your interest and questions, uh, you can just talk more about certain things. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the center uh, and the idea of the center, city as a lab, you know? So for you guys, most of you are familiar with that um, kind of concept, but I want to give you a little bit of background on that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about three um, main things that we do in, in traffic safety. And my PhD research had to do with um, incident management. So I looked at different aspects of incident management from duration of incidents, the delay estimation, and the control. The control part was uh, very interesting at that time, so I spent most of my time on that. Uh, but over time, uh, I don't want to leave the PhD students. And you get a faculty job, you also go towards different directions based on funding, uh, and, and then so on. So I did other things. So safety, um, so I have some safety routes on incidents, incident management, accidents, uh, but, uh, you know, this is basically on, on that, that aspect of my work. Uh, uh, so let me just motivate you a little bit, uh, those of you who are not familiar with safety and whether we care about it. It's a big problem uh, and it's, it's uh, really creating uh, more, bigger problems all over the world, more than this country. Actually, uh, the drivers in in US, uh, I read an article. They're the most defensive drivers in the world. They're the safest. Uh, so if you go outside with the auto ownership increasing and so on, uh, there is really uh, a big problem about about safety, um, and and we had to do something about that. Uh, there is um, this idea of Vision Zero. How many of you heard of Vision Zero? 
So great. So this is basically, you know, there's uh, not only us researchers, but also agencies, government, they're interested. Uh, Seattle, I found out, I didn't know, is a vision zero city, uh, but also New York City. And then every year we have a conference and it's a big deal. Uh, people come over uh, and our, our mayor is kind of really uh, kind of proud that uh, we reduced the number of deaths uh, as a result of this uh, vision zero. And one thing that he did is that he reduced speed limit all over the city to 25 miles uh, per hour, okay? So when I teach my, my students, I say, what is the one thing that you could do, for example, take a city to make number of accidents, traffic accidents, to go to zero? Any idea? Just ban all the cars, <laughs> right? So obviously you cannot do that. So. Uh, since we cannot do that, we need to kind of understand the, the um, reasons and uh, you know, the background about accidents and then develop some engineering solutions to deal with those. Uh, so uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, our, our center's main idea and, and we'll give you uh, a background why I'm going to talk what I'm going to talk. Uh, it's connected vehicles, big data, and the safety uh, research. Uh, so one thing that uh, C2 Smart, this tier one UTC center, is a uh, 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 smaller version of what you guys have here, is to, 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 to work on urban areas uh, and then to work on different um, technologies that will generate so-called big data. Uh, uh, but we are not just collecting data for the sake of collecting data. We are trying to see how different technologies and how different uh, 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 sensors and so on will, will help improve uh, urban operations. So we call it city as a lab because New York City is kind of a, a very tough lab, you know? So if you make something work in New York City, uh, it will really kind of, you can claim that it might work uh, in other, uh, other places. So in order to do that, in addition to obviously the real world, uh, we also would like to focus on uh, cyber type of test bed, which is simulation based, uh, based test beds. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go over certain slides very quickly. So the transportation system is very data rich. Uh, and then uh, there are different components. And it's also not just cars. No, it's, it's people, uh, it's uh, uh, the government, it's uh, the agencies, and so on. And each of them, they generate certain amount of data and then you can use that data uh, to solve uh, different kind of problems, from real-time traffic prediction to the safety problems. You know, so there's a wide range. Uh, and actually, the claim here is uh, that if you have data only for tra traffic crashes, you can do something with it, but not too much. You know, you need to know other things, like who are these people, what kind of vehicles you have. Uh, you know, what kind of roads you have, what kind of weather you have. So, so you can really combine data from uh, different sources to make better sense out of your existing data. So the idea is to be able to uh, merge different data sets in a meaningful way so that researchers, companies, agencies can make use of it. So New York has something called Open Data Initiative. Uh, so they claim that uh, they can they put all their data in the uh, big server, and you can get it. Of course, it's not everything they have, but it's really still useful. We try to do some advanced version of that at CUSP, Center for Urban Science and Progress, and then we had this uh, problem I call uh, black hole problem of data. Do you know what that means? Or what I mean by that? So basically, the data drips in, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, and it becomes like a huge amount of data. But when you get the data out of that database, it becomes very difficult. You know, sometimes you cannot even get the data out of that big data warehouse. So we need to think about how to do certain things smarter and not create this black hole of big data. OK. Uh, so the other, the second idea is basically uh, be behind this test bed. And I'm going to make the claim that uh, you know, there's basic R&D coming from the university. Uh, and technology firms, uh, they need to do the uh, prototyping, uh, but then you actually have to do the field testing, you know, field pilot. Uh, and then you deploy it uh, to the marketplace. And this kind of cycle does not exist currently. It's not very good, you know. Uh, so 
the government understood this, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that, uh, especially with this um, new technologies coming out. I mean, uh, sensors, uh, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles. You need, you need better testing, and not only testing in the lab, but also testing uh, in, in real world. So university has a, play to, has a role to play with that, but as transportation engineers, we're not uh, very well uh, prepared for it. We don't have it, you know? So some people are uh, trying to do it, but it's just uh, a challenge. So basically, what we're saying is C2 Smart uh, should work with uh, technology providers, public agencies, uh, uh, different living labs, to create this uh, uh, cyber physical test bed to, to test different uh, technologies. Uh, and the, the reason also behind this is when I was doing PhD, transportation system was in a steady state. You have cars, I mean, they have a little bit of improvement, but now all of a sudden, you know, you have all these new technologies coming up, you know, from autonomous vehicles, uh, ride sharing, uh, mobility as a service, uh, all kinds of these new ideas. And actually, that's why we are getting a lot of new students who are interested, but they're also bringing their own challenges because we don't know how to operationalize these things. So, so what we're saying is that we need to create a, a framework uh, to really uh, uh, understand which technologies will work, which technologies will not work. Uh, in general, uh, what happens is there's a mature technology, and then the, uh, whoever owns that technology will come and will try to sell it to the agency. But agencies don't know. You know they just don't understand, and they have difficulty. So in New York, for example, if you uh, are reading New York Times online, uh, recently, they had, uh, they, um, you know, passed, I don't, I don't want to say law, but regulation to cap the number of Uber, uh, Uber cars. Because there were so many Uber cars, it was creating congestion. So, but the question is, is it a good policy or is it a bad policy? It's a great technology, everybody likes Uber, but how can you evaluate that? Maybe first on simulation, then, so, then in the real world, and then make some uh, more educated um, uh, you know, policy decisions. So Uber is one extreme example. But just recently, uh, I talked to one of these guys who are doing e-scooters. Um, and they have a similar problem. You know? So you can have e-scooters in Brooklyn, uh, but not in Manhattan. We don't know why. So, so again, university has a, play to, has a role to play with that. And that we would like to create this, this framework uh, on this. So if I just um, want to conceptualize this, uh, computer science guys are really ahead of us in that. Uh, on the right, this is, I, I borrowed from a, uh, one of the computer science uh, papers. So, uh, so there is really uh, a lot of sensors and sensing. There is big data, data analytics. Uh, there is open loop decision making. What we mean is offline. You make decisions, and then you kind of put them in the field, say number of Uber cars or your uh, uh, you know, policy for parking. But then the next step will be a closed loop. So you put that policy in place and then put a feedback loop to see how you can change that. That obviously becomes more uh, interesting and more uh, challenging. And in the end, the dream thing, I don't know if it's a dream thing, but the, the end product people see it is like autonomous city. So city that makes its own decisions without really needing uh, human beings interfere that much. I don't know if it will happen in our lifetimes, but uh, that's uh, you know one of the things. Okay, uh, so uh, let me just talk about a couple of uh, things that we are doing. So we we building a MatSim. Uh, this is an open loop agent based simulation model, um, simulation of the whole New York City agent based, meaning like every traveler, everybody on the transportation network is individually modeled. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Professor Chao. Uh, we are building a sumo, uh, more microscopic test bed uh, that's connected to this um, uh, microscopic in the sense of uh, traffic operations connected to MatSim. It will help you to, to do more uh, traffic engineering oriented research in terms of signal timings, ramp metering, traffic control, and so on. So one of the innovations here is that we are connecting the two together. There are two different uh, models, but we are connecting them together. We are also connecting them to sensors, uh, the data that's coming from real world sensors to continuously update and, and calibrate them. Uh, so one thing that 
uh, is kind of driving for uh, thing for us, they're both uh, open uh, source models. So we kind of completely abandoned uh, commercial products. We don't want to use them anymore. We made a decision uh, because we want this to be a research-driven process, so we have no patience uh, to have a black box. We want to see the code, make changes to the code, so these are the things uh, that we are using. Uh, so what are we doing with those? I mean, a Maxim, for example, allows us to test different policies. It cannot be tested right now, given, uh, uh, given the, the current state of modeling tools uh, most of the agencies have, like ride sharing, uh, uh, you know, multimodal travel of users, real-time information in a very uh, dense way. Uh, we are also, like I talked before, uh, uh, adding all these different data sets uh, from uh, New York City open data set to, to what we have to make this a data-driven uh, process. So this is basically uh, what kind of data we collect. So we, we started collecting regular like a traffic data, but now uh, we are collecting more on data for on smartphones, uh, social media, uh, and, and, and things like that. So let me give you a couple of other physical test beds that, that we're doing. So this is uh, a joint work. Uh, USDOT has a, a, a new uh, pilot test for CV. So this is like a subset of that. Uh, so NYU is basically leading that effort to create a physical test bed for visually disabled uh, pedestrians. Uh, so we are uh, working with the city DOT. Uh, there's an uh, app provider who is providing uh, developing the app, uh, but we'll be collecting the data and we'll be doing the evaluation of uh, the usefulness of this kind of wayfinding uh, uh, type of app uh, in, in New York City. Uh, as part of this project, New York City uh, is deploying roadside units, uh, instrumenting uh, uh, you know, cars uh, and, and so on. Uh, so this is uh, the, the uh, kind of infrastructure that we have developed. Uh, one thing about this kind of project, uh, some of you might not be aware of it because they're human subjects. So we have to be very careful in privacy. So you cannot really uh, put everything out. So we have to build specially uh, um, developed uh, protocols and uh, 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 servers to keep uh, the privacy of people uh, under check. Uh, only certain people can access to that data. Uh, the data is anonymized, and then it will be made available eventually. Uh, and so this is uh, like a huge effort uh, that's, that's going on right now in conjunction with the rest of the project, which is much bigger. Uh, around five to 8,000 vehicles are being instrumented. So this is only the, the pedestrian part uh, that, that we are dealing with. On the vehicle side, we are basically, uh, uh, I'm going to, I have another, uh, uh, slide on that, but on the vehicle side, as I said, there's five to eight thousand vehicles that are being instrumented, and there are a bunch of uh, apps, and I'll show you those. Um, so we are also building the small-scale labs, uh, and if there are anybody here from mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, you are probably familiar with that. I did this during my PhD, almost I don't want to tell you how many years ago, uh, but I can tell you that the uh, wireless technology was not there yet, that, uh, so we had to wire, uh, use wires to connect the cars uh, that are being uh, controlled. So it was so many years ago. Uh, so, uh, so basically here we're trying, so we're doing some control algorithms, but we are trying them on the small scale uh, because we cannot model the hardware, we cannot model the controller. So we, but you don't want to also put it out on the, on the road with real vehicles to avoid crashes. Uh, and then here we are basically doing the small scale modeling. You would say, oh, but there's so many of these uh, algorithms. Why is it that uh, this one needs that? Because this one is a really unique uh, way of doing the control. We call it uh, a learning algorithm. So basically, uh, the following vehicle doesn't exactly know how the leading vehicle makes its decisions. So by just following it, it, it just learns from the way it's driving, and it adapts to that. So it's all kind of risky. So if you put this in the real world, you might have a, a crash here. We had many crashes, so no problem. Um, so the other thing we also have uh, 
cyber uh, lab. So this is one project that I started many years ago. So basically, uh, this is a bus lane on Lincoln Tunnel. So those of you who are familiar with New York City, uh, this is a dedicated bus lane. Uh, and then uh, several years ago, they said, let's build another tunnel because there's not enough capacity, not for buses, for cars. We said, instead of bu uh, building another tunnel, uh, what if you did uh, longitudinal control, headway control for the bu existing buses, how much capacity gain uh, you might get from uh, just doing that. Um, so, so we uh, use this same adaptive cruise control algorithm that I showed you in the, in the hardware. We tried in the simulation. Uh, and again, here there is a lot of human uh, nuances. You know, drivers are different, buses are different. Some buses are new, some buses are old. So basically, can we get stable and very efficient uh, and small headways and what kind of improvement that we would get? Okay. So I have a simulation here. Uh, so basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we uh, did several things. Uh, so when the buses come into the Lincoln Tunnel, and any of you from your traffic engineering uh, class, remember anything about Lincoln Tunnel or Holland Tunnel? So uh, Bob Herman, uh, uh, and, and all these like, uh, Ghazis, uh, they, when they did the traffic engineering studies, they used uh, these tunnels as a test bed. Uh, and the reason, uh, especially Ghazis did that, and he was a Port Authority employee, because uh, you have to maintain constant speed and you cannot do lane changing. So this is like a perfect uh, place to do real world study. So he was able to get this, uh, uh, you know, headway distributions and how people drive and so on. Uh, so we are using the uh, same facility for buses and then see how they're going to uh, behave. Uh, what, what we saw is actually you could get, uh, you could get 20 to 22 percent increase in the number of total buses that you can fit into that tunnel without making any changes, just if you had headway control. And actually, that is equal to the number of people, if you have an occupancy of 1.5 person per vehicle, uh, equal to the people that you can fit in the new tunnel that they want to build for $10 billion. So for each bus, the cost of this, adding this kind of technology is like a few thousand dollars. Uh, and it's over time, you know, uh, because there's a depreciation. So you basically, if you bring the technology, uh, you could definitely uh, improve uh, traffic without making this major investment. I presented this idea 10 years ago almost, not with the same algorithms, uh, to Port Authority, and they kind of laughed at us. They said, oh, it cannot be done. You know, who cares, you know? Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm being recorded, but I, can, I told them this also. <laughs> and then one problem they said it was a real problem because you can have more buses, but when they come to Manhattan, they go into the bus terminal, and there was not enough capacity. Uh, so what do you do with it? I said, that's not my problem. That's your problem, but I'm showing it can be done. And lo and behold, like a year ago or a year and a half ago, they hired a consultant to do the same kind of simulation with much less sophisticated uh, uh, models uh, to see if this is feasible or not. So now they come after 10 years, they come to, to listen to what we said after like three presentations to them. Uh, and I think university has to be like that. So there's no bitterness, you know? So, uh, so we published the paper, uh, we presented it, and now the agencies, they uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, catch up. But it's the, the same idea, you know? If you have this test bed and if you can get them engaged, maybe this cycle will be slower. Instead of 10 years, maybe in three, four years, they will get that. So let me see how am I doing. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is something our students prepared, and I'm glad that there's no sound. Uh, so this is uh, the big Matsum test bed that, that we are building. Uh, and some students, they took it on their own. So this is how uh, the Matsum uh, simulation looks like. So Professor Chow's students are doing the uh, they're doing the uh, calibration of it. Uh, my students are doing the traffic calibration. Uh, and basically, we are looking into different policy problems that cannot be modeled in a four-step planning model like CUBE or others. Uh, and then we're trying to see uh, how we can 
uh, sort of like autonomous taxis, because, because you can model them, you know, you can model Uber, you can model Lyft and different kind of things. Uh, and, and you can do it for the whole city. And we are running this on a regular PC, no supercomputer, uh, no specialized thing. I tried to do it on a, uh, a GPU. Uh, it takes more time to make this run on a specialized hardware than just a regular hardware. You just all, all you need is a big RAM. You know? So you have a big RAM, uh, it runs pretty nicely. So we do well, we, we calibrate the simulation, okay? So obviously when you calibrate the simulation, you validate for the base case scenario, okay? But most of these policies are not there, but there's some uh, basically uh, kind of expert validation. We do that, you know? But for example, there are no autonomous taxis, so we really cannot validate it, but we, it has to make sense, you know? Uh, for things like Uber, and Lyft, we can do some validation because we have the data from them and we are doing that. You know? But I'm also thinking about using the same thing for evacuation, for example. You know? Something like Sandy, uh, when you lose some of the uh, transit capacity. Uh, so we can use some Sandy data, but it's only one point in the whole universe. So, so it's ma mainly it has to be expert validation for most of the things that we are looking into. But the key here is uh, we want to do things that you cannot do with a regular travel demand model, uh, or it would be very difficult to do. You know? So that's, that's the key idea. By the way, when we show this to DOT, they like it. And when we show them Sumo with uh, more traffic signals and so on, they like that more. Okay? <laughs> so, so you have to be careful. You know? Actually, we want them to work together. So you do this because the traffic model in Matsum is quite uh, you know, simple. Uh, so, so if you want to do like a more detailed traffic modeling, you have to do something like Sumo, uh, but you, you want to be able to do, put them together. Use one's output or the input to the other one. Okay, so now uh, this is, again, uh, you know, I might not be able to finish everything, but I want to give you some ideas. So, uh, so I don't know why this is here. Some, okay, so basically, uh, um, one uh, of the things that I've been working on for several years now on, on safety. And then, uh, for safety, uh, anybody is here working on safety research? No? Okay, so people, so most of you, you don't. So basically, we want to understand why the crashes are happening and what can we do about this. And, and if you look at the way it's done, you know, you, you, you had the crash data. Uh, you can identify hotspots, you can do countermeasures, and you can do before-after evaluation. Basically, if you make a, a change, uh, improve the, uh, the highway, let's say, does it really um, you know, uh, improve your, your system? Okay? Uh, so there is also this recent uh, work on highway safety manual, uh, like highway capacity manual. So they, the safety people, they said, you know, Traffic guys have the capacity manual, let's have the safety manual. That means like a, almost like a simple way of looking at the impact of improvements uh, and some of the prediction uh, methods uh, in terms of, of crashes. The reason we say reactive uh, for these methods because you have to wait until the crashes happen. And because it's a statistical problem, you need a few years of, let's say, do, do before after analysis. You need before, a few years before the improvement is made and a few years be after the improvement is made. Okay? So I had a, a PhD student who is now a professor at Old Dominion. Uh, he opened his PhD dissertation. He said, it's unethical to do that. You know? I said, what do you mean? He said, because you wait the crashes to happen. You know? So can we do something faster before people are killed or injured? And that, he has a point. Uh, so we, uh, but this is the, the practice, this is how we do it, and I put our recent report, this should be online very soon, I finished quite a large project for New Jersey to predict, the, to estimate safety performance functions for uh, 16 different facilities in New Jersey. So in New Jersey is one of these states, the crash data is publicly available, uh, but nothing else is uh, as available as the crash data. So this was a big project in terms of getting the data, traffic data, highway data, and so on. And then I can give a talk, full talk about that, but I don't want to do that. So, so many states are at this stage of basically developing safety performance functions. And then 
eventually uh, uh, crash modification functions. Okay? Uh, so this is, I, I mentioned, uh, this is what I mentioned. Uh, so, uh, so can we, so, so the, now the new thing is, can we do something else? Can we find surrogate measures that we can use before the crashes occur? You know, is that feasible to do? You know, so what do I mean by surrogate measures? Uh, so basically, um, you know, crashes are rare events, so they don't you don't see a lot of crashes, but you see near near crashes, near misses. Okay, so if we can get that kind of information, maybe there will be a surrogate safety measure for us uh, to un uh, identify high risk locations and the reasons for these high risk locations. Okay? So. Uh, and actually, if you go and watch an intersection, you see a lot of near misses. If you're driving, and I'm assuming you're driving and in, in New York, many of the students don't even have a uh, driver's license, but if you're driving, probably every day you say, just, I just missed it, you know, because you're talking to your uh, wife or girlfriend and she's like not happy with something, whatever, you know, I mean, uh, you know, or like your son is calling you and he wants something and then you're not paying attention, it's not an accident. So you don't have an accident every day, but you have these uh, uh, near crashes. So if you can get those, maybe you can do something with them. Okay. So, so this is, uh, but still you're working with uh, historical crashes and, uh, uh, and, and creating some surrogate safety measures. Uh, but there's also this new idea of proactive safety management. That means uh, you know that certain places becoming high risk uh, in real time. And I like this because it goes back to my PhD thesis because we did real-time traffic control. But can you do real-time traffic control? Can you do real-time measures for proactively improving the situation and reducing the risk of accidents? So what allows us to do this kind of work is basically the new technologies like connected vehicles, uh, computer vision, smartphones, and so on. So now it's the right time. So I give this uh, example. Why is, obviously, you could have thought about this many, many years ago. Uh, but anybody heard the little computer called? You're too young. You wouldn't. Uh, maybe Ian Hai is the only one who would remember that. Uh, not that he's old, but he's close to my age. So uh, it's called, it used to be called Newton tablet. OK? So Bill Gates came up with this idea of Newton. You know, it looked like exactly like iPad little bit fat, okay? And everybody made fun of him because the co communication technology was not there, the computation was not good. Then 15 years later, here comes iPad, it's the same thing. And it worked, and everybody has an iPad. So, so now, I mean, for safety, I think we are in the right place, the right time to do some of these things, okay? So let me just jump some of them. So this is, uh, so there is um, the first uh, one of these uh, efforts was in Michigan, University of Michigan and USDOT did that. Some of this data is publicly available. Unfortunately, not all of it. So they did instrument vehicles, connected vehicles. They collected data. Uh, and it's, it's really sophisticated, a lot of vehicles, long time. Uh, but I think they are not uh, releasing all the data. But the data that they released is very valuable. So one of the uh, things that I'm going to talk about is how to use that data. Uh, so this is basically, they instrumented these vehicles. They have um, typical data acquisition, but also sensors. They can get uh, all the braking, acceleration, deceleration, all kinds of information. They have MyoVision uh, uh, video, so they can get the video and so on. So this is uh, something very valuable. And they ran this for a long time uh, to understand how people behave. And then there's an app that's running. So it gives warnings. It says, slow down or, or uh, be careful. So, so you could see people's reaction to this kind of thing. Okay? Uh, there is, what I mentioned, New York City uh, pilot test. Now, the previous slide says 8,000 vehicles. It's now 5,000. So we started with 10,000 because we are, so that's part of the reasons for uh, this pilot tests. Because when you start doing the real thing, you find the problems, why it's difficult. So this is, uh, but right now this, there'll be 5,000 vehicles uh, and there are uh, several uh, test beds within the city, not the whole city. So the Flatbush one that you see here is behind our campus. Uh, so there is several intersections with roadside units, cameras, sensors, and so on. They'll be running these uh, connected vehicle uh, pilot. 
Uh, there's one in uh, Wyoming, which is much simpler than what we have, but very useful. Uh, it has trucks. And then there's Tampa Connected Vehicle Pilot. Most of these Connected Vehicle Pilots are safety oriented. So they are designed to see how the Connected Vehicle technology can improve safety. Uh, you can go to, I have the links, you can go to uh, internet and find a lot of information about that. So these are big projects, multi-year projects, and, and, and actually as part of the team, uh, we participate in many meetings and we learn a lot from each uh, of these. So, uh, so now let's talk about some of the research that uh, we are doing with this data. So this is uh, a, a recent paper uh, that we use the Michigan data. Uh, and again, there's a lot of details. I might jump around some of them uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, so the research question is, can we use this connected vehicle data to um, estimate surrogate safety uh, measures to qualify uh, the risk uh, for different kind of far car following scenarios, ma mainly uh, rear end type of crashes? OK? So uh, my student who did this work, Di Yang, uh, he insisted that I put this slide. Uh, this shows how much time he spent on, on working with that data. I said, I don't want to put that slide because I don't know anything about it. He says, you have to. He says, like, I have spent so much time getting the data uh, from the Michigan uh, data set and then make sense out of it, massage it, and all that to make it work. So, uh, but. Again, uh, the problem with some of these things is that the amount of data is a lot. It's not always very clear what the data is, so you need to spend a lot of time for data preparation and, and so on. Uh, so uh, there are uh, almost 15 million GPS points for one month that, that he looked at. Uh, what we are being told is that more data is coming, but I haven't seen it. Obviously, hopefully, there'll be more, more coming in. And this is the... No, no, this is not the 5,000 vehicles. This is less number. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a few hundred. Okay? 5,000 is in New York, but we don't have it yet. Okay? And I don't want to spend too much time. New York, so Michigan is the perfect place for that because it's not a very big network and it's not very congested. And New York, we have other problems like <laughs> with GPS. So we're not getting the GPS coverage. So here, the coverage is, is pretty good. Uh, so this is for one month. Uh, there are 75 different uh, locations. So we were able to get also the crash data, uh, the network data. So everything that we need, uh, we were able to get that. So the idea is basically is to get uh, the, the surrogate safety measure. This is not from Michigan. This is, I think, someplace in, in Russia. So uh, I found this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if, if this is a real crash, but obviously there are a lot of them that they, they just like miss, you know. So, uh, so basically, what we want to do with this kind of things, we want to get the trajectories, and then see uh, what happens. Okay. So there are two uh, well-known surrogate safety measures, TTC, that looks into uh, the speed of the leading car of the uh, uh, following car and their relative uh, location. Uh, there's also the decision rate uh, type of circuit safety measure. Uh, but uh, they have their, their own problems. And there are a few slides, but uh, let me tell you the major shortcomings. And this comes from this paper, 2015 paper by Kuan. Uh, it's a really good paper. I think the reference is here, not our paper. Somebody else's paper in accidents and prevention. So what he showed is that uh, you know, sometimes uh, these, these, these measures do not really capture what would happen in, in real world, uh, especially for two vehicles moving closely, uh, but at a speed that they will never crash. So in real world, what happens is, uh, you know, the leading vehicle might, you know, very minimally slow down, and they will uh, create a crash. So. So how do we capture those kind of situations? So we need to have more sensitive measures uh, that are not as static as the existing ones. Uh, so there are two kind of situations. One is the crash when uh, the, the following vehicle uh, ca uh, catches up with the leading vehicle, or the crash when uh, the, the, the following vehicle, the, the leading vehicle uh, completely uh, stops and, and hits the uh, leading vehicle. So for the second one, these previous measures will not apply. So he proposed a measure, basically a very simple idea, very difficult thing to read. 
paper is difficult to read. Uh, basically, the idea is that they are traveling at a uh, certain speed, uh, but then he creates a disturbance, a positive disturbance. It means he adds a deceleration to the leading vehicle that will create a crash. And then, and then sees what happens, how many vehicles will be affected by that. So this is called time to collision with disturbance. Okay. So, so he basically uh, models that. So there again, two uh, outcomes. One is uh, one they, uh, before the other one stops, the leading one stops. And then the other one is when the leading one uh, stops and then the other one catches, catches up and then hits it. Okay. So basically, it's very simple physics because you can basically, you know the distance uh, between the leading and uh, following car. Uh, you know how long it will take to stop the leading car when you have certain deceleration rate that comes from a uh, probability distribution. Uh, and then you can calculate the, the, the star optimal when they will crash, the time that they will crash given their initial conditions and the deceleration rate. And then you can, again, uh, look at these two scenarios. And then you can create uh, two different situations uh, when the, the deceleration rate is less than the d star. That means the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, time that, that they, they will hit when the other one just stopped. Or the, the collision uh, when uh, they hit when the leading car stops uh, because the deceleration rate of the, the, the leading car is much higher than the d star. So basically, these are uh, two, two measures that we have. And then uh, we basically take those uh, and then simulate, using Monte Carlo simulation, different scenarios for different deceleration rates, and then calculate the number of times this TTCD is less than uh, the uh, uh, safe TTCD. Um, and then divided by the number of trials that we have. So it gives you a risk measure. So the good thing about this is I can change my distribution. I can change uh, my uh, initial conditions. And then I can get different risk measures. So it's not a static one like regular TTCD. Uh, and then I can also find the optimal TTCD uh, because what I do is I keep changing my threshold value to make sure that the correlation between the number of near crashes uh, and the actual crashes are uh, maximum correlated. So this is uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the threshold value, changing the threshold value uh, used in different measures, TTC, uh, drag, and TTCD, the one that we're trying. And then you get the highest correlation in this case. Of course, uh, there's some unfairness here because we do much more involved uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, type of testing here. Okay. So um, one thing here, as you see, the threshold value, uh, if it's less than 1.7 second on the average, uh, that's like uh, a dangerous situation. Uh, when you do this in simulation, there is uh, a problem with that. Uh, because most of the car following models might not allow you to have uh, uh, reaction times uh, lower than that. So, so you might have some problems with the simulation. So you have to go play with the simulation. Okay. So, uh, so what we do is we take these counts of dangerous situations uh, and then plot them. Uh, plot the number of actual crashes and plot the AADT uh, for the, for the uh, Michigan network. So as you see, I mean, visually, uh, uh, what we calculate in terms of risk measure using the TTCD is similar to actual number of crashes because we kind of also made sure that our TTCD star, the optimal TTCD, uh, gets the highest correlation. But to our surprise, uh, we don't see the AADTs uh, kind of closely correlate with the number of crashes. Forget about ours. Uh, so in general, this is the exposure measure. So you want to see a higher level of correlation between the ADT and the number of crashes, but this data set doesn't show that. So it might be different reasons, but uh, that's like to make the point that uh, maybe just using that kind of basic uh, correlation between number of crashes and ADT is not enough. Maybe you really need to get some of these um, uh, surrogate safety measures or other kind of measures to capture. 
Uh, so this is, again, some of the animation. How, so because we calculate these values over time, so we can actually change how the risk model, the change in time, how it's changing uh, over time during the same day uh, and then different days. Uh, and then you can see how the risky locations are changing. So instead of just uh, looking at the crashes that are kind of static and limited in number, because I have a lot of these near misses, uh, unsafe conditions, I can actually see how these um, are changing uh, over time. So this was, uh, you know, uh, one interesting study that showed how we could use this connected vehicle data to actually find correlation between crashes and then represent risky locations uh, in time. How much time do I have? So 3.30 is the, okay. So I'll, I'll go very quickly, just give you some, uh, uh, you know, things. So this is uh, with um, another paper that we wrote. So this is instead of using uh, the Michigan uh, vehicle type of data, which is specifically designed as an experiment, we got some data from uh, a, a company that collects uh, probe vehicle data and then um, identifies uh, risky behavior as heartbreaking, fast accelerating, uh, phone use while driving and speeding. So they give you this, this type of thing and they have thousands of vehicles. So we said, can we use this data instead of Michigan type of data uh, to identify high risk locations? Uh, and this paper uh, is all about that. So I mean, there's a lot of details in this, but basically I don't have time. So basically we were able to show that uh, you can estimate a model uh, to, to predict uh, the uh, risky locations uh, as a function of uh, not only location, but also time. Okay. Uh, and here we did something uh, clever. Uh, so, so this is uh, the estimated function with the location specific uh, uh, contribution. And then we uh, uh, subtracted uh, from uh, the, the average uh, um, count uh, prediction. So, so the difference is the potential improvement of the safety. Uh, so basically it gives you some kind of a potential safety improvement measure, uh, again, using the same kind of data uh, which was uh, uh, useful to understand, uh, to rank different sites uh, that has the highest potential uh, for improvement. Okay. Then you can uh, you know, plot these uh, different uh, risk measures and then you can see where the uh, high risk locations are. Again, not only in terms of space, but also in terms of time. So if you look at the time of day, the high risk locations are changing. So this is around uh, Lincoln Tunnel. So around the tunnels where you have high traffic, uh, you see that this is uh, another tunnel here. Uh, so you can basically identify these locations, the times. For example, you can have more police officers. You can have uh, lower speed limits. You can uh, change your traffic signals to just improve uh, safety conditions. OK. So the final one, this is, I, I really like this project. Uh, so I had to take two minutes to talk about it. So this is a project I got from uh, AIG. Uh, anybody heard of AIG? No? AIG is an insurance company. So they had a kind of competition, so we wrote a proposal. Uh, so they uh, liked the idea. So the idea was, can we use regular traffic cameras to find these, tra uh, to extract these vehicle trajectories? And New York City has 600 of them. Uh, and then use the same idea of surrogate safety measures with trajectories to identify high risk locations. So this is, a, it's not only me, so there are some computer science guys uh, who worked on different aspects of this project, basically on extracting uh, the trajectories from the uh, low quality traffic cameras, uh, you know, like 15 frames per second, and there's a lot of problems in, the, in terms of focus and so on. Uh, and these are some of the papers that we wrote. Uh, so basically, these are all the traffic cameras. So without uh, having to install new equipment, uh, we proposed to use that, and then we uh, basically uh, took a couple of different locations uh, to, to test the idea, okay? And then this, so you can basically use some well-known 
uh, trackers like KLT trackers and so on to get the trajectories. What happens in a city environment, those trackers that work very well in the lab, and if they're electrical engineers, don't take offense on that, they fail miserably in real world because it's just like difficult, you know? You have big trucks, small trucks, you have uh, uh, sun, uh, you have the blocking of the, the shadows of the buildings and so on. So, so we did a lot of smart stuff, not me, uh, the other members of the group, uh, to, to get the trajectories and then uh, clean them up. Okay. So this is basically uh, all the different steps that they had to go through. Uh, for example, one of the things that you would be surprised is a problem is that uh, the perspective problem, because you are looking far uh, ahead, so the vehicles that are farther from you look smaller. Uh, so you want to track them, you need to kind of correct for this. Uh, so which view do you think is the best view to get this kind of thing? Right, for an intersection, let's say. Bird's eye view, you know? So you go to the uh, 19th floor, so everything is the, because, because of the distance, everything is the same size. So then it's easier to track them. But if you do from a street level, it becomes more difficult, okay? And then when you do uh, a good uh, cleaning and all that, then you can get the trajectory of each vehicle uh, from different frames. You can also get uh, the uh, pedestrians and so on. Okay, so uh, the key idea here, we did many things, is to use uh, uh, hidden Markov models basically to predict the change in risk levels, to teach, uh, do like machine learning, to teach uh, the algorithm if there's a change in the risk level. And if there's a change, high risk situation, maybe you can do something with your signal timing or with the warning to the vehicle or, or, or so on. So we uh, developed this, uh, a hidden Markov model, uh, and these are all the details of that. Uh, and then we tried, of course, this is kind of trial and error. So you had to uh, try uh, different uh, hidden uh, uh, sets and also uh, different covariates. And then we found the optimal one. And then when you plot, uh, you see that uh, there are different risk levels uh, for different uh, uh, intersections. And then this is like a more disaggregate version. So there's jump from risky to less risky, more risky. But one thing that we found out as is that if you have, uh, let's say, level two risk, uh, it always goes, uh, it's more likely to go to level three risk, for example. So a higher risk levels will uh, lead you to um, even higher risk levels. So you need to do something. It's like you go into doctor checking your blood pressure. You have to do something. Uh, in, in, in good time before it gets really worse, okay? So uh, I know I'm out of time. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, new things. So, so these are like examples of what we have done. So there are a lot of new things uh, that we are doing. So we are using drones to get this vehicle trajectory data. So this is actually uh, our video. Uh, so I learned a lesson. Uh, so I said, I'm not going to do this image processing because very difficult. So we found a company actually that can do this image processing for you online. Uh, so, but my students are flying the drones. Uh, they're, uh, you know, um, recording it and then they can generate the trajectories for us because we are the end user of that. We are not the users of the technology. Uh, there is the connected vehicle work we are doing. We're also doing work with uh, smartphones and so on. Uh, but there are obviously many questions like, uh, you know, privacy, uh, you know, the sample size, selection bias, and so on. So uh, especially for the trajectory data, for example, we are very limited. We don't have days or months of data. We only have hours of data. So what can you do with that? What is the right sample size? So there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, questions that are still there. Uh, but, uh, but there is, the future is there. I mean, there can be, many things can be done. So one problem with the drones, they can only fly for 20 minutes. So you need to have like a real team to change batteries and all that, uh, and we're trying to do that. So uh, with that, I can uh, stop and take some questions. If you're still awake. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, this, this is like my class. I, I they have no questions. So, uh,
very interesting presentation on multiple topics. So I have a question regarding the, the collision line that mm -hmm. the surrogate variable. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to calculate the potential of the collision mm -hmm. by looking at the, the time needed, right? mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is available time. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that equation, a very important variable is actually the perception reaction time. Mm -hmm. So are you treating that as a constant variable if yes, what number you used? So, so the, that's the, uh, yeah, the, the good question. So that's basically the, uh, that's the threshold. So, uh, so what we're saying is that uh, the minimum time you need to be able to stop, you know? But we are not uh, separating it into how long it will take physically for the vehicle to stop and how long for the person to, to perceive that, you know? Yeah, so, in the equation you listed, uh, yeah. like, uh, Speed multiplied perception time mm -hmm. plus the deceleration. Yes, time. but we're not we're not separating them too. So so the, the, the threshold value has both of them together. Okay, uh, but that's a good question. So of course the reason we don't have that uh, is very difficult to collect to get that kind of data from individuals. So but you know. Uh, so we treat them as together. You know, so. The reason I'm asking this question is actually in my dissertation mm -hmm. back to 1998, I set up some, several equations and I assumed the distribution of the perceptual mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I wonder if the data could provide a validation. For the, some definitely, we can look at that. So definitely, and, and as I said, you know, there is also another possible error because most of the time we are using simulation. So simulation is a fixed. Uh, perception time. So when you change that, the results might change too. So, so definitely there is, that. I'll read your dissertation. You saw the uh, the your extended map uh -huh. uh, for the high risk yeah, location. Huh? Um, when you do that, did you normalize with the traffic volume? Though? Yes, yes. So uh, it normalized with ADTs, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that, and I mean, uh, most of the high risk locations are expected. You know, as I like entrance of the bridges, entrance of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing is, again, maybe that's not also some some of it is trivial. They get changed in time because traffic changes in time. Right? But here we're just looking at uh, not the severity, just basically the frequency. Uh, so if you do like more work on the types of severity, for example, you might find a different kind of result. So we're not doing that. We're just looking at the frequency. Yeah. So is there a good correlation with the traffic volumes? For New York City, yes. Uh, okay. So, I mean, my guess, the reason it doesn't show a good correlation in Michigan, for example, because it's a small sample of, it's a small sample of connected vehicles. Uh, so they might not be representative samples. So in Michigan data set, you might have other problems. But for New York, especially the company that gave us the data, uh, they have um, thousands of probe vehicles. So I don't think the sampling is a problem there. So given the time constraint, I think maybe the time for one more question. And then we can do a kind of a, uh, discussion. After this, you see we have also the refreshments there. You're welcome to take this before you leave for maybe your next class. I saw this. I saw this as some kind of a cosmetic brush. I know. That <laughs> I was going to use. But when, they, when they gave it to me, I said it's not. You know, I said, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. It's like, uh, anyway, so I'm wondering if you could comment upon the um, difficulties you encounter when you try to connect Maxim uh, to Sumu. Like, uh, what are the challenges you encountered? So it's so what we do is not a real online, real-time connection. Okay, so basically what we try to do is uh, we take the uh, the the estimations from Matsim, let's say in terms of demands and so on. Uh, when you change certain things, for example, the number of autonomous vehicles or number of taxis, Ubers, whatever, and then feed that into your Sumo. So it's it's kind of uh, is hand holding still, so they're not working together. You know, uh, if you want to make them work together, 
that's different, you know. Uh, so we're not trying to do that. So basically, we are trying to get the output of, of Maxim, like the output from the real world, and then feed it into Sumo and get some results and then check like, if it makes sense in the Maxim sense. Oh, so, it's, it's, okay. uh, so it's kind of faking it, you know? <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, all three questions are from professor. Is there anyone from a student? Anybody want to make a try or call? Um, my question is, I believe when you were talking about your first paper, you were talking about some probe data you got. Mm -hmm. Was that from like a cellular provider? Uh, the first one is Michigan. So the government uh, in you know, collaboration with University of Michigan, they collected it. Obviously, there's a probably cellular provider to get the data, but everything is in the car. So okay. they have, the car is instrumental. Okay. okay. I just, so I the second one is, is the second one, the, uh, the New York one, is they do it through the cellular provider. OK. Yeah. I noticed that one of the risky behaviors was people who use their cell phone for more than three seconds. Well, this, this is the second one, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I just I wonder if there's a conflict of interest there because the cellular people are the people providing you that data? No, 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 it's not cellular people. They have an app. OK. So they give this app to probe vehicles, mainly fleets. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, uh, there's, they sign all kinds of non-disclosure agreements, so we don't know who they are. OK. Uh, so this is actually for insurance purposes. Mm -hmm. So they track their drivers. Like, like, and there's many of these apps now, OK? So let's say uh, UPS, whatever. So they want to see how their drivers are driving. OK. okay? And then they, it's not even online. So they collect this data on the phone, and they dump it somewhere else, you know? And then that, uh, I mean, there are very interesting things they do, which I'm not doing. So for example, if uh, you have too many uh, hard stops, uh, you get a warning. Or if you have a few of them, you get like a brownie points. Things like that. Many, I mean, in the literature, there are many people doing that kind of stuff. So this data is about that, but not through the uh, cellular provider. OK. okay? And they know if somebody is looking at his phone, again, through the app. Yeah, because yeah. The, the phone comes alive. So they assume that he's looking at his phone. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, so given the time constraints, so we will conclude here. Thank you very Thank much. You. Let's Thank give him a, another big round of applause. <laughs> so we have the reception here. Uh, feel free to help yourself and continue our dialogue with Professor Osby. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I hope I didn't take too much time. So. I was